So long before The Bachelor became must-see TV, the dating game was all the rage. But not everyone on the show was looking for love. What would you say if I told you Bachelor number one was a serial killer? When Rodney Alcala went on the show in 1978, he'd already gotten away with the murder of at least five women and earned himself a place on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list for the attempted murder of an eight-year-old girl. I think it's fair to say that the background checks were a little lax back then. He went on to murder at least three more girls. One of them was only 12 years old. Now that number might have been four, but the bachelorette Cheryl Bradshaw refused to go on the winning date with Rodney. She thought he was creepy and she probably saved her own life just by trusting her gut on that. So good on you, girl. But detectives say up to 130 other women weren't so lucky and many of them are still unidentified. I'm Amy, and this is True Crime Recaps. Before we jump in, I want to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. Chris and I love this documentary streaming service. Their team of producers and curators bring together premium content that dives deep into important documentary subjects. Of course, our favorites are the true crime content, and lately we've been obsessed with Murdered Online. It's about a girl in South Africa who gets like a temp job at a local store, then ends up assaulted, violated, and left for dead on her first day. Through some miracles, she was able to tell a friend about the four men who did it to her, but they were never convicted for it. But if that doesn't sound like something you'd be into, no worries. Magellan TV has the richest and most varied true crime content available anywhere. And if you're into the paranormal, this collection dives into the fascinating links between crime and the paranormal, as well as true crimes throughout history. And let's just say that with over 3,000 documentaries covering everything from true crime to space and science and history and nature, with new shows added every week, you're definitely going to find something to binge watch your weekend away. I mean, if you're into that, which we totally are. And right now, they're offering our viewers the chance to try Magellan TV free for one month. Just click the link in the description below to get started today. Again, that's a one-month free trial of Magellan TV exclusively for True Crime Recaps viewers when you click the link in the description below. And now, on with the show. Rodney Alcala hunted women to torture and kill simply because he enjoyed it. He used his skills as a photographer to lure thousands of potential victims into his orbit. He would toy with them, bring them to the brink of death, revive them, then strangle them to death. After he took their lives, he would position their bodies into gruesome poses and keep on snapping pictures. As one LAPD detective said, this guy is a psychopath of the first order. Hundreds of photos he took were discovered in a secret storage locker he rented in Seattle before his arrest in 1979. Men and women of all ages, even little boys and girls, are caught in candid poses. Some even look unconscious, and at least 900 other photos couldn't be made public because they were too X-rated to release. So is this a serial killer's photo album of victims? Huntington Beach, California PD released these pictures in 2010, and in the first few weeks, only about 21 women raised their hands to put their names to some faces, but at least six people claimed they recognized loved ones who disappeared in the 70s and have never been found. And in 2013, one of the photos was the key to solving a cold case in Wyoming. So how many others could be victims waiting to be found? This smooth-talking killer was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1943. In 1951, the family moved back to Mexico. Three years later, when he was 11, his father abandoned them and his mother moved him and his two sisters to Los Angeles. At the age of 17, he joined the army and he served as a clerk. Three years in, he was already getting into trouble for robbery and an assault on a random woman in New York. Then he went AWOL and fled back to his mother's house in California. While he was home, he exposed himself to his little sister. So what the frick is wrong with this guy? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. Army doctors diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder and he was honorably discharged. 
Since then, he's gotten several other diagnoses, including narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and malignant narcissism with psychopathy and sexual sadism thrown in for good measure. Of course, it's important to point out not everyone with those diagnoses is a killer. Of course, in no way. It's just that some killers do share those diagnoses, but they've got plenty of other stuff wrong with them. And Rodney was certainly no exception. He used charm, manipulation, and cold-blooded violence, and he didn't give his victims fear or pain a second thought. So after he was booted out of the army, he graduated with a fine arts degree from UCLA, and he studied film at NYU under a fake name. Now, if you've ever had dreams of being discovered, this is the guy people warned you about, that smooth-talking predator that would tell you he was going to make you a star and then, you know, rape and murder you as soon as you let your guard down. But let's start with the first case that put this monster on police radar in 1968 when he was 25. Her name was Tali Shapiro. He ran all the way to New York City, where he enrolled in NYU film school under the name John Berger. For about a year while he was in the city, he worked at Blue Cross Insurance. And as it turns out, he wasn't the only psychopath in the building. That's not an insurance joke. It's an actual fact. All right, here we go. His co-worker was Richard Cottingham, otherwise known as the Torso Killer. The two killers actually worked in the same office on the same night shift, according to an interview author Christian Barth did with author and historian Dr. Peter Vronsky. In June 1971, while Rodney was in New York, he strangled a 23-year-old TWA flight attendant named Cornelia Crilly. They found her in her brand new apartment with bite marks on her breast. At the time, police suspected her boyfriend, a guy named Leon Borstein, who was an assistant district attorney for Brooklyn, but he was never arrested because he didn't do it, but okay. Her case stayed unsolved until 2011. Now, years after her murder, Leon speculated that Cornelia must have run into Rodney as she was moving into her brand new place. He told ABC's 2020, I can easily see her invite someone up to help her move the furniture. She was a very secure child of the 60s. She wouldn't think anything like this would happen to her. I mean, who would? But shortly after that, Rodney was on the move again. He ended up in New Hampshire, where he talked himself into a job teaching photography at a summer arts camp under the name John Berger. So talk about a real-life American horror story. He might have gotten away with it, but the FBI had added his name to the list of most wanted fugitives for the attack on 8-year-old Talia back in L.A., and two of the summer campers happened to notice his face on a wanted poster in a post office. Can you imagine? So he was hauled back to California, but Talia's parents refused to let her testify to the rape and attempted murder charges. She did recover, if I didn't mention that. She did recover, thank God, but they refused to let her testify. They had actually moved to Mexico after Rodney escaped. But because they didn't want to bring her back, to go to court, the rape and attempted murder charges were dropped to assault, and he served less than two years before he convinced a prison psychiatrist that he was safe to return to society. Spoiler alert, he wasn't. And how about this for a bizarre fun fact? The LAPD detective on his case was Steve Hodell, who is no stranger to evil himself as the son of Dr. George Hodell, a man who many people believe may have been the Black Dahlia killer. But of course, Rodney was far from being rehabilitated. You might say he was just getting into his stride as a serial predator. Two months after he got out, he was busted with a 13-year-old girl who said he kidnapped her. So did that tip everybody off to that this person was a danger to others? No, not really. He was locked up for violating parole and giving marijuana to a minor. Two more years went by, and again, he convinced everyone he was a changed man. And they bought it, hook, line, and sinker. And fresh out of prison for the second time, he managed to manipulate his parole officer into letting him travel to New York to visit family. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Rodney decided to drive cross-country, which is how he crossed paths with 28-year-old Christine Thornton in Wyoming. Now, take a look at this picture he took of her on a motorcycle. She was six months pregnant and just broken up with her boyfriend. Her body was buried only a few yards from where this picture was taken. And this picture was one of the photos hidden in that storage locker I told you about. 
She disappeared in 1977, but her body and that of her unborn baby weren't found until 1982. She wasn't identified until 2013, when a relative recognized this picture of her and submitted a DNA match, which gave Christine her name back. But because so many years had passed and the evidence was disintegrated, they couldn't charge him with her murder. But taking it back to 1977, investigators believe Rodney was only in New York for one week when he killed 23-year-old Ellen Hover. She disappeared on July 15, 1977. The only clue was a calendar entry that said, Meeting John Berger. Other than that, it was like she simply vanished. And none of her friends or family knew any John Berger. And when she went missing, people heard about it. Ellen's father owned the famous Ciro's nightclub in Hollywood. Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. were her godfathers. A year after she vanished, her bones were found in a shallow grave on the Rockefeller estate in upscale Westchester County in New York, 100 feet from a spot where Rodney once photographed another woman. And how about this for a coincidence? I told you he worked the same shift as the torso killer, right? Well, Ellen was murdered just three blocks away from Richard Cottingham's new office location, according to that same interview with Peter Vronsky. Can you believe that? The NYPD thought he was their killer until DNA pointed back to Rodney, but that was still years away. In 1977, after her murder, once again, Rodney picked up and left town, headed back to L.A. So while the cops in New York were trying to track down this mysterious John Berger, Rodney, using his real name, mind you, got a job as a typesetter for the Los Angeles Times. Now keep in mind, this guy was a convicted sex offender with prison time under his belt, but that certainly wasn't slowing down his career or his twisted social life. In November 1977, the half-naked body of 18-year-old Jill Barcombe was discovered on a remote dirt road in the hills of Los Angeles. She'd been violated and strangled with her pants. She was found posed in a fetal position. Marlon Brando's house was so close to where she was found, the police interviewed him about her murder. Until Rodney's DNA incriminated him in 2005, police thought she was a victim of the Hillside Strangler, another predator who was active in the area at the time. And here's a bizarre coincidence, number 5004 in this story. Jill's friend, 15-year-old Judith Miller, was actually murdered by the Hillside Strangler a month later, according to ABC's 2020. I mean, you did not want to be living in L.A. in the 70s. On December 16, 1977, the naked body of a 27-year-old nurse by the name of Georgia Wickstead was discovered in her apartment in Malibu. She'd been beaten with a hammer, violated, and strangled. And remember, at the time, Rodney was actually working for the newspaper that was covering his crimes and those of the Hillside Strangler and other predators. But even though the LA Times didn't care or, or know or care, or no, whatever, that he was a sex offender, the police were suspicious enough to question him about the Hillside Strangler cases in March of 1978, thinking he might be their guy. What they didn't know at the time was that he was even more dangerous. It was during this time that he appeared on The Dating Game. So knowing what we know about him now, how did this guy actually win a date with Cheryl Bradshaw? Well, CNN put basically the same question to criminal profiler Pat Brown. And as she said, he was aware that he could say things that were considered sexy and funny and the girl would like that. And he watched the game and he gave those answers and he won. So he learned some tricks. But a psychopath's true nature comes seeping through off camera. And he's showing his psychopathic personality in the green room. He wasn't acting then, and he probably literally hated those other two bachelors. He was going on the show to prove how special and wonderful he was, and his ego was riding on winning it, which very much lines up with what Bachelor Number 2 told CNN. He said he couldn't even stand to be near Rodney. He's even leaning away from him on the show. And in the green room, he said Rodney was quiet, but at the same time, he would interrupt and impose when he felt like it. He was very obnoxious and creepy, and he became very unlikable and rude and imposing as though he was trying to intimidate. So thank the Lord, the bachelorette Cheryl Bradshaw called the producers the very next day and backed out of the date, saying she felt weird vibes coming off of him, and she thought he was really strange. You know, she was uncomfortable. 
Rodney did not take the rejection well. Not long after that, in June of 1978, another woman was found violated and strangled with a shoelace in the laundry room of her L.A. area apartment. Her name was Charlotte Lamb. She was a 32-year-old legal secretary from Santa Monica. Now, her body had also been posed with her arms behind her back. Some of her jewelry was later found in his Seattle storage locker. His reign of terror could so easily have been stopped at any point in this story. Heck, it could have ended with the attack on Talia Shapiro, but because the justice system in California in the 70s was so ridiculous, he just kept getting opportunities to kill. And yet another chance to lock him up and throw away the key was missed in early 1979 when a 15-year-old girl called the police from an L.A. area motel room claiming she'd just escaped her kidnapper and rapist, Rodney Alcala. They arrested him but gave him bail, which his mother paid, which meant he was free to kill Jill Parento, a 21-year-old computer key punch operator. He broke into her Burbank apartment on June 13, 1979. Luckily, he cut himself climbing through her window, and he happens to have a rare blood type, but it would be years and years before he was actually convicted for her murder. It seemed as if he was in the middle of some kind of, like, frenzy, because just seven days later, he snatched 12-year-old Robin Samso off her bike in Huntington Beach. He first saw her playing on the beach with a friend, and... True to form, he approached the girls and asked to take their picture. According to that friend, Robin said yes, but an adult nearby scared Rodney off, but he didn't go away. He waited and stalked Robin for the next few hours until she left for ballet class. She was riding her friend's yellow Schwinn bike because she was running late, and that's when he grabbed her. Her remains were found by a park ranger in the L.A. foothills 12 days later. And the gold ball earrings she was wearing when he took her were later found in his storage locker in Seattle, along with the photos and other trophies. Now, meanwhile, the police had released the sketch of this creepy guy that had come up to the girls on the beach. And guess who recognized the man in the picture? Rodney's parole officer. He was arrested at his mother's house on July 24, 1979, and this time it seemed like the state of California was finally realizing what kind of monster they had on their hands. In 1980, he was found guilty for Robin's murder and sent to death row, but let's not start celebrating just yet. His conviction was overturned on a technicality, so trial number two got underway. Thankfully, he was kept in prison. In 1986, the jury convicted him again, and again they gave him the death penalty, but you're not going to believe this. In 2001, his conviction was overturned again on another technicality. So the DA started gearing up for trial number three, but this time they caught a big break. A state law had just passed forcing prisoners to give DNA samples to be compared to cold cases. And back in the 70s, a killer like Rodney... Um, he wasn't too careful about the DNA that he left at the scene of his crimes. And he must have had some idea what was in store for him because he was adamantly opposed to giving up his DNA when they came for it in 2003. But as a prisoner, he had no choice. And that is how they connected him to the murders of Georgia Wickstead, Charlotte Lamb, Jill Parento, and Jill Barcombe. So with this new information, the prosecutors decided to shake things up and use his third trial to try him for those previously unsolved murders, in addition to the murder of 12-year-old Robin. So for that trial, Rodney decided to represent himself. And he had a surprise witness against him, Tali Shapiro. By then, she was a grown woman, and she wanted the chance to point the finger at her childhood attacker. I just love that. So reports say Rodney actually cross-examined himself and spoke in a different tone of voice when he was playing the lawyer. And he would blow kisses to Robin's mom and just generally act like the evil person he was. I mean, what a circus. Thankfully, the jury was also horrified and he was found guilty of all five murders and sent back to death row. Now, remember, he was also wanted in New York and his DNA was the missing piece to solving the murders he committed there. They gave him 25 years to life for taking the lives of those women. So he'll start serving that time if he's ever released from Corcoran Prison in California. It's about 50 miles outside of Fresno. 
and he's in good company. Among other notorious criminals, that prison is home to the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, Philip Garrido, the guy who held J.C. Duggar prisoner for decades, and Charles Manson was there before he died. So he's in the right place. And that's your recap. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please give this a like and subscribe if you haven't already. We appreciate it so much. And remember to hit that bell so you always know when a new recap is posted. Until next time, stay safe. <laughs>